Right, Nanga Zabetsa Kesti, a live stream, Mr. Matsotsutso. Nengon Rapto. All right, any game. <laughs> All right. Buenas. Buenas and half a day, Toro Samzu Gwena Hudzung. Estigi on Otro episode Fanatsu. This is another episode of Fanatsu. Guahui host Mizu Tatlu. Non who see Michael Luhan Bavakwa. I am again. Once again, your host for this very special episode. And when I say uh, special, I'm being a little time mamala, little bani dosunai, because um, today I will be talking to some very close friends of mine. We are all part of a very uh, historic program. And so, as you can see from the picture here, at the nesti mambunitun tautau ayade. Look at all these beautiful people in this picture. And and uh, I'm excluding myself. I look kind of weird in this picture, dispensed so. I don't know what I was thinking. I think I might have been a little bit hungry uh, in this in this picture. But I am here in Hawaii, along with five others from the Marianas Islands, in what is a sort of a historic uh, program, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Museum Institute. And so this program has brought uh, Pacific Islanders who work in the cultural arts, who work for uh, in in language revitalization? Who work in museums, in cultural centers, historians, performing arts, um, from a, from I, I believe thirteen different island communities, um, brings them together for a month long program at the East West Center, uh, the University of Hawaii Manoa, and it's been. Uh, we are one week into this program, and I'm very happy to have three of those from the Marianas uh, here with me today. Half a day, half a day, Hamzu Toros, half a day. Buenas, and so let's. Uh, hungan, hungan. And so let's actually look real quick at this. So. In this program, this is a, these are some bios from all of the people involved. Um, and so not everyone has uh, not everyone has been able uh, to join us here uh, in Hawaii for this program because it is one month long. But you can see there's people from Saipan, there's people from the Chamorro diaspora. There's Archie here who has who has joined us uh, for this podcast. He's from the Northern Mariana Islands Museum. We have people uh, from uh, we have Pam here from Lanai from Hawaii. Uh, oh, there's me and Oguahu from the Guam Museum. We have uh, Mina, Amina Ellison. We have Nicole, uh, who also comes from Guam. Uh, Mina is from the Big Island Donkey Mill Art Center. And then we've got uh, Regina Fitiao from American Samoa, Alini, who uh, is in Samoa. Just amazing people. Hoku, who works in the film archives at University of uh, West Oahu, Kirikara from Kiribati, um, who works for the museum there, Mariah from Fiji, and of course, Arlinda, who is joining us here, Senora Linda from the Joe Tin Q uh, Public Library in Saipan. And so Erica Radowagen from American Samoa, Kuelani uh, Reyes from the Kamehameha Schools, and then Elisa Santos, who's joined us today, who works for the uh, Commission on Defino Tsumoro, the Chamorro Language Commission in Guam, uh, Ruby from the Auckland War Memorial Museum, Tyler, who was supposed to be here, but when they managed to be a sit better, see Tyler, I don't know, uh, you know, Tyler is, Tyler, is, he's, uh, he's, he's out there somewhere. I hope he shows up. Or, or if we have another episode sort of uh, uh, reviewing what we've gone through, we, we hope he can join us. Tico from PNG, and so you can see from this amazing list of people, um, all of them gathered uh, for this program. It's it's a wonderful experience to 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 meet so many others, to learn from them. And so, um, Erlinda, Senora, I want to give it to you first. Um, and for for all of you, what has it been like over the past week? We're one week into the program, and then um, what are the things that have have stood out to you? 
so far. Pafadei Senhor Miguel, se dos mais não convidam para a bem Daniel ou Paulo na bonito em Taluani. This week I've actually really learned a lot. It, it, it's only been a week, but I can say that I learned a lot from this uh, this uh, program. Uh, visiting the Bishop Museum, seeing the, uh, the 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 diary of the Queen, that was actually one of the uh, most like breathtaking. You know, just seeing a diary from from 1893, I think I believe, and also um, visiting the various uh, institu institution that we've we've visited the past week. Yesterday we visited the um, mission house and Elisa and I partnered up and we actually did the, uh, we, we looked through the uh, gold watch that was uh, gifted to Reverend uh, Kekela by Pres then President uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, for saving an American uh, in the Marquesas Islands. So that was very, um, it was very powerful. So, I mean, learning a lot today, we, we learned how to properly clean a, a door and it was a copper door, you know, so we did a lot of hands on today, which was very, very um, educational for us. And not only are we sitting in a room and listening to instructors and listening to um, to all these professors talking to us, this hands on actually has really helped us as well. So uh, and, and aside from the learning, you know, actually, I'm really, really um, happy to to have met 17 other people that I've never met in my life besides Zoom. So the friendship and the camaraderie that we we have vested thus far is actually something that I'm, I think I'm going to take away the most. Jesus Masi. Jesus Masi, Senora, Jesus Masi. And uh, no, thank you for mentioning that. We've gotten to, to see amazing artifacts, even in sort of the short time that we've spent in visiting places. Um, Archie, put for board, if you don't mind, uh, can you share some of the, how you, you know, some of your reflections from the past week? Uh, anyway, my name is Archie Ahoste. I'm working currently in the NMI Museum of History and Culture in the island of Saipan. Um, my reflections on this that, um, you know, um, I don't really have much experience on the museum, I'm just the administrative assistant and a certified docent for the museum. So this, me being here, I mean, I learn a lot, um, getting to meet new people, getting to have conversations of like problems in the museum and connecting to anything from experiences to problems and then finding a solution. So um, of course, every museum that I know, like, talking through all the other 17 cohort uh, classmates that we have, storage is always a problem in the museums. So visiting the Bishop Museum is really, it's, it's like a wow factor for me that there are different types of storage uh, spaces and ideas that you can do. And that just opened up my mind in researching more on having storage facilities and creating. So, and then, yeah, um, just being here even gives me the opportunity to move up on my job. So, yeah, that's all. And I hope uh, we can have another podcast next time so we can update you with our trainings here. Zils uh, Masi. Hey, Zils Masi. Thank you so much, Archie. Um, no, I, we're all, uh, one thing that I found is that people are at all different points in their journey in terms of, uh, where they're at professionally. And so I think that that's good. You have some people that have lots of experience in this, some people that are newer, uh, some people that have, you know, were in one career and then changed and then now are sort of, uh, in, in more museum cultural center. I'm one of those people. <laughs> I was a professor at UOG for 10 years. And then now I'm the curator at the museum. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a humbling and an enriching experience. So Elissa put for both, I wanted to give you a chance. And of course, Elissa, for you, this is uh, in a way sort of a, a scholarly homecoming too, because you did spend a lot of time 
you know, we're all of us were all kind of like, Ooh, what's that? What's this? And Alyssa's like, oh, that's this. You know, so esta mega tiningonya for the Ilenat Laguini gives a Hawaii. She already knows a lot. Uh, very familiar with this because she was here at UH Manoa. And so Alyssa, what is it like sort of you coming back here to a, a place where you had a lot of friends, uh, had a lot of scholarly conversations, grew intellectually, and then now you're coming back representing the Commission if you know tomorrow. First of all, thank you, Dr. Bavakwa and Independent Guahan for having us today. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, yeah, with regards to um, my return here, it's been surreal. Uh, clearly, I'm seeing um, the same spaces that I've operated in, whether it's the dormitories or the um, East West Center campus and, you know, spaces we've been in at UH. Uh, so I'm seeing familiar uh, facilities and buildings, but I'm missing my friends who used to be here. However, I'm extremely excited about um, reconnecting with uh, old, uh, old friends, um, mentors, and uh, making new friends, like, like uh, Senor Archie and Senora uh, Erlinda. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be back. Um, as far as my reflection, I think I just want to start by saying this is really, you know, the brainchild of, of Noel. She's one of the organizers, and I just want to give her a shout out, give her credit for um, basically coming up with the idea of this program. We know she and her colleagues like Karen Sasa are very um, um, passionate about this work, about museums and collections, um, cultural heritage and, and representation. And so uh, I really just want to acknowledge her because this is, this is the product of her hard work, of her envisioning, and because she shared that with uh, her colleagues like Karen, Teresi, uh, Annie Reynolds of East West Center, um, they've developed, and Helena, uh, they've, they've developed this really amazing program um, for us. I think one, thing that I'm extremely grateful for is their acknowledgement that in, in different islands of the Pacific, we don't always get this kind of training, right? We don't have the resources, um, we don't have the training or, or programs to teach us these things. And so with the opportunity to come out here to learn from them and to learn from uh, other professionals in their network is, is really an honor. Uh, so I just wanted to start by saying that. Um, something I'm, I'm extremely like happy about seeing is every time we uh, have a lecture, a guest lecture or a field trip, um, we're seeing a lot more Hawaiians in these spaces. And, and you know, um, we are on again, Kanaka, Mali land. So it's, it's wonderful to be um, guests here, uh, to, be, to be welcomed so lovingly by the Hawaiian people. Um, in and outside of these institutions and in, in these spaces. They've taken great care of us from feeding us to sharing, really being extremely generous with the knowledge and resources they have. Um, and I think that's, there's something to say about that. You know, they are very determined to make these spaces more accessible and inviting for their people as well as other Pacific Islanders uh, like us. And so, I think they're moving in a great direction and, and I'm happy that we're here to celebrate that with them. No, it's, uh, it, you're, you mentioning sort of more and more native Hawaiians and then sort of creating spaces for other Islanders. That's definitely, a, I've definitely felt that too. I mean, even when we went to the Bishop Museum, um, most of the people that we interacted with were, you know, were native Hawaiian. And so that was a, that was a really nice sort of experience. And I think that's, something that uh that throughout this whole program a lot of us can appreciate and so i wanted to get everyone's perspective on this because this is one thing that for me like when i was growing up in guam uh i never called myself a pacific islander um never really thought of myself in that way but once i went to california for grad school i was uh, suddenly i was you know 
Yeah, sure. Sometimes uh, being, you know, sometimes you see somebody with a Guam sticker or with a Chamorro t-shirt and then, and then you feel, oh yes, you know, I'm not just a sort of a, a fraction of a drop in a bucket, <laughs> but for the most part, you feel marginalized. You feel like Pacific Islanders are pretty invisible. Uh, Islanders are invisible. And so when I was out there, I started using the term Pacific Islander more to think of myself. And here we're in a space in which, um, you know, Islanders, you know, really dominate. It's not, you're not the token. You know, I'm used to being uh, at a conference and there's a thousand people presenting and then two of them are Pacific Islanders, right? And so I wanted to hear uh, your thoughts and, and any of you, uh, whoever is interested in sharing can share, uh, but on being in a space in which we are not sort of the the token, we're not sort of the exotic other, right? I mean, um, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but if you're the token Islander and, they're, and you're gonna have a party, somebody says, oh, can you do a hula for us? Or, uh, or you're, what's it called? So you're, you're, you're celebrating something, they say, do you know how to make a lay? You know, because you're the token Islander, you're there for the, the window dressing, you're there to make it pretty or to make it exotic. You're not really there as a person. And so I wanted to, who would like to share and talk about that? Um, it, what is it like being in a space where it's all Islanders? It's all Islanders. And so Erlinda, did you want to share or Elissa? Archie or Erlinda? Yeah, actually, I, can, I can share a little bit. It actually, I've been to conferences in the States where you're right, being the, um, I guess I can I can say I'm sometimes I'm the only Islander, Pacific Islander in, in the conference. But being in this conference uh, or this this um, cohort that we're in, with surrounded by a lot of I mean just, just mostly, well all of us Islanders. It just it's a lot different and more comfortable. You know we can relay. Um, we we have a lot in common, and and we share the same. I can say we share the same, um, um, you know, haves and don't haves in our in our coming from a Pacific Islander, you know, going to a conference in the states with all, um, you know, a lot of those people who are at the higher end, they don't really see the need or what we need here in the Pacific Island. They don't see um, what well, what kind of climate we have in terms of museum and all. So being in this in this cohort with all our, our brothers and sisters from the Pacific Islands actually makes a lot of difference because we all understand each other. We all know what we need from coming from an island. And the closeness, the closeness that we are in, in, in terms of locations, even though some of us come from a different area, uh, still we understand, we understand each other and in, in, in the terms of what our institution um, needs are. So um, those are my thoughts about being in a Pacific Islander um, in, in a conference or in this cohort with all Pacific Islanders, uh, brothers and sisters. Just to add to what uh, Senora has said, I like her, I, I definitely feel comfort in this space. Um, it's one thing to talk about, you know, being Pacific Islanders in, um, be, what, what it means to be a Pacific Islander and another thing to, to talk about what it means to be a Pacific Islander in these sort of Western institutions, right? Um, and um, I think a lot of us have just been able to be open about sharing these challenges um, and, and a lot of those challenges being tied to colonialism or colonial histories and experiences. And so um, we also, we, we empower each other, we validate, each other's feelings in this space, you know, people are, are not dismiss, dismissed. Everybody's willing to listen and to learn and to reflect and to cry together. Um, and I think there's something really powerful and beautiful about that. Um, something, you know, I remember Noel uh, saying to us on our first official day of our, our ceremony when they, they performed the Ava ceremony for us to welcome us. Uh, she sort of gave a little speech afterwards. She did uh, a beautiful a chant, a very powerful chant. And she said, no one's going to stand in our way. And you don't often hear that. And um, just to kind of feel that solidarity, to feel that, that connection 
uh, I think means a lot for us. I think a lot of us were very overwhelmed um, at that event. And then our, our um, session in which we gave our introductions, right? And, and selected an object that represented who we were. But there's just, they've just given a lot of thought into creating space for us to, to, to talk and to share when and clearly many of us have been silenced in some way or our ideas and visions have been dismissed in some way, right? So, um, yeah. No, just Marcy, thank you for that. Um, Archie, go ahead. Yes. So I just wanna share an experience on when I got, when I was in Denver, I moved to the Bay Area. So um, while, on, while I board on the plane in uh, the Bay Area at San Francisco airport, uh, the whites told me uh, that, where are you from? And all those things, I said, I'm from Saipan. And they said, where's that? I said, it's an island. It's uh, north of Guam. And they told, they told me that, uh, wow, you dress and talk smart more than a Pacific Islander, which is shocking to me. It's like so discriminating or racist. So me being here with this group gives me the confidence and I can talk to everyone like without any discrimination problems because basically everyone here in this cohort, we have the same problems and we're trying to find the solution for it by helping each other. No, Sidus Masi, thank you all for sharing that um, one of the people that has been, uh, we've heard from several times uh, over the past week is uh, Sean Mallon, who's a senior curator at the Te Papa Museum in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And he did a talk in which, you know, he basically was talking about curators at museums and then uh, kind of the, the politics of race, of, of race, ethnicity and culture you know, that uh, he showed a picture of all of these Pacific curators from about 60 or 70 years ago. And it was all of these uh, stuffy white men <laughs> in suits and ties, you know, and, and some of them looked friendlier than others. Some of them I definitely wouldn't want to share an Uber with. Uh, some of them, maybe they might try your Kelleguin Manok and they might say, well, this is fascinating. This chicken salad is delightful. You know, who knows? Some of them seemed like they probably hated brown people. Some of them seemed like they liked brown people. But you looked at them. He showed us this image of all these Pacific curators. And it was it was a stark contrast to those of us who were in the room. It doesn't, you know, this does not mean sort of that, uh, that somebody who has a European background is Caucasian or whatever, that they can't study the Pacific or they can't be knowledgeable about it. But they represented a time in which they were basically telling the world, this is what Pacific Islanders are. And Pacific Islanders weren't empowered to tell our own stories or talk about each other or share our perspectives. And so, um, Alyssa, what you mentioned about Noel, uh, sort of uh, emphasizing that at the beginning, that's a strong point. That's part of the reason why we're all in this uh, in this program together. And so I do want to sort of recognize the funding for this comes from the National Endowment for the Humanities and that the uh, UH Manoa Museum Studies Graduate P Certificate Program and the East West Center are both co-organizing uh, this program. And there's a, a whole bunch of great faculty um, that have been helping us, including uh, Noel. Uh, and so it's been, uh, it's it, but it's been great. I mean, <clears throat> we've, uh, you know, we, we discuss, we learn, and then we always have uh, reflections. We always have reflections. And so um, it's important too, as we learn and as we absorb sort of that we reflect. Um, and so I wanted to, we're, we're towards the beginning. I wanted actually to give a chance for each of you to share a little bit about the institution that you represent here because it's the muse, the focus is museums, but not everybody here comes from a museum. Uh, me and Archie represent museums in this program, but Elissa, Senora, or Linda represent different organizations, which are definitely connected to education, culture, and history. And so I wanted to give each of you just a chance to talk about uh, 
you know, what is your what is your institution? Uh, who are you representing while you're here? At some of our at some of our meetings, we talk about who do we bring with us, and so we're uh, we're usually talking about our ancestors, our families back home, but sort of who do you bring professionally <laughs> into this? And so, uh, Senora Linda, how go for that? Put for Okay, so just master senior. Um, so I come from a library, a public library. I am the director for the Jolten Keys of Public Library. I'm also currently the president for Piala, Pacific Island Association of Library, Archives, and Museum. Um, so at the library where I'm at, uh, we have a small Pacific collection area that we um, we take care of, and actually a lot of artifacts in there. Uh, we are in a we are hoping to to grow. We're hoping to have add more collections to it. So um, that's one of the reasons why I'm in this institution. And to bring back, to represent uh, my community from the Northern Marana, Marana Islands, to, to bring back what I learned and to give back to the community. So um, basically um, on this trip out here, as I mentioned in our previous uh, presentation, I bring with me my grandmother for, instilling the highest um, highest uh, part of our, our upbringing is uh, to respect our elders and to respect our, our ancestors. So um, that's basically uh, where I'm from, <laughs> from Saipan and mm -hmm. where I work. The, oh, and put for both, because you know, a song in Diridi Podesti, because people from Guam always ask, who, how do you see Joten? Hadzi CQ, Hadzi Anunatautam. And so, um, because uh, can you, Kosinun Sagani Hamna Hadzi Anunados Tautam? So, Jotan, si Jotan and Kizu, uh, of course, the library's name after Jose Camacho Tenorio, better known as Jotan, and Manuel Semen Villagomis, better known as Kizu. Uh, these two gentlemen, along with other prominent businessmen and women, and the community of Saipan, put together funding um, that was needed to um, give their community a public library, a public library that we didn't have. So with their generosity and their vision of giving back to their community uh, in 1991, uh, December 1991, the Jotenkizu Public Library, library opened its doors. Uh, before I came over to to this institute, I actually celebrated my 30th anniversary at the Joe Thinkins Public Library. So I, I got into this position or into, into the library field um, just immediately after high school. So these two businessmen actually uh, put funding together to, to give back to the community, to have a public library for, for, our, for our future, for, for everyone to enjoy. Uh, Archie, go ahead. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Signora. Uh, Archie, go ahead and tell us a little bit more about the Northern Marianas uh, Museum. So anyway, uh, just an introduction to the NMI Museum. Uh, the NMI Museum is uh, situated in an old Japanese hospital that was operated in 1926 to serve the public. So, and then opened its doors in 1998, November 4, 1998. So the NMI Museum, actually most of the funding grows, goes to the maintenance of the building because it's a 96 year old building. Um, so the NMI Museum, we only have four staff, our director, our facilities manager, I is the assistant, administrative assistant and the certified docent, and we have an office assistant. So we are we have inadequate staffing, but we help each other to keep the operation smoothly, running smoothly. And we have a lot of events. We do events with, uh, with the public for the LGBTQ, Pride at the Park, uh, we host events like um, Taste of Marianas. Uh, we do professional development days like Miss Erlinda, the public library, the Joe Tinkies Public Library. Uh, we did a professional development day there. 
So where the museum stands right now, uh, we are modernizing the museum and we are putting uh, technological advancements. Sidus Masi, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And so Elisa put for board Sangani Ham Nai Puri Kumishani Finut Sumuru. And I and I saw I saw some commission members watching uh on the on the Facebook live stream for a little bit. And so please remember that you you are you are currently being monitored by Imagasmo. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hi everybody. Um okay, so uh, folks from Guahan will probably be more familiar with our institution, but for those who don't know, the Kumashani Fino Tsamoru uh, is basically the Chamorro Language Commission on Guahan. And a lot of our work centers on Tsamoru language revitalization. A uh, little history about the Kumashan. It was established in 1964, really for the sole purpose of standardizing the Tsamoru orthography, continuing the work of the Marianas Orthography Committee um, and um, developing a dictionary. Um, fast forward in time, the Kumashon was later dissolved into um, the Department of Chamorro Affairs in the 1990s. And then it was later reestablished in 2016 under the uh, Chamorro Heritage Act. And so um, our mandates right, have expanded since the 60s, um, a lot of which reflect uh, or are geared towards the promotion of Chamorro um, uh, Chamorro language, culture, and history to include things like restoring indigenous place names, helping to build, um, you know, curriculum around um, cultural topics and, you know, helping um, GDOE and other government institutions, right? Translation work, things like that. So um, a lot more mandates, a lot more responsibilities. Um, but I guess one thing to focus on that that connects us to this institute is the fact that we are generating a tomorrow archive. So uh, clearly, you know, our people are generating more and more texts in our, our language. And um, even the commission itself is producing educational materials and uh, recording, you know, more of our elders to document our language. And so, we are generating a growing archive and we wanna make this accessible to the public one day. You know, our, our materials are currently available for anybody to use, but you know, we hope for, um, we hope to expand our space, um, build further infrastructure and, and our digital platforms to make this accessible. And so uh, this is why a program like this is extremely helpful, right? To help us build that capacity. Sidus Masin. Sidus Masin. Again, it is, um, yeah, I think uh, being here in Hawaii, we see that, you know, a lot of times when we think about museums, preservation and stuff like that, we think of like a single entity. But as we have seen here, even just in this week in Hawaii, there are all of these different institutions and entities um, that lay claim to different parts of Hawaii's history, its archives, its cultural collections, and that, uh, you know, and so it's, and then in Guam and the Marianas, I don't think that we've really thought about that to that extent. Like, where are these things? There's the Nieves Flores Public Library, there's Micronesian Area Research Center, there's the Guam Museum. But look at that, that's amazing that the, the Commission is collecting everything that's written in Chamorro because that's very, very important. Um, and I wanted to actually, um, I wanted to, to focus in on this because today we, earlier today we went to, uh, or actually this week, the cohort went to the Hawaiian mission houses. And one of the things that they have there is they have of course the first printing press in the Hawaiian islands. And in fact, this, uh, it is the biennial the 200 years since the first printing press. Now, of course, the history involved is missionaries and, mission, and sort of there's detrimental impact to native Hawaiians because of the presence of the missionaries and so on. Absolutely, we learned a, a lot of that history today. <clears throat> but um, thinking then about the amazing breadth of 
uh, archives and sources written in the Hawaiian language, but then thinking about sort of what is out there that's written in Chamorro. You know, what can we make available? Because um, Erlinda, for you, uh, you know, working at the library, you know, books written in Chamorro, even uh, Arch Archie at the museum, are there archives and documents that are written in Chamorro? And then Elissa at the Commission, you must find a lot of things uh, written in the Chamorro language. And so uh, Erlinda, first, uh, like uh, what kind of Chamorro language materials do you have uh, in the, the, jo the Joten Kidzu uh, library? Uh, so, Sidus um, Masi Senor, at the Jote Kids Public Library, we we're actually very fortunate to work closely uh, with the First Lady, Di uh, First Lady Lady Diane Torres Foundation. Uh, she's currently the First Lady of the CNMI. She's a very um, she's a, a big supporter of literacy and a a, a teacher herself, an NMI history teacher. She actually her foundation publishes local books, encourages children of school ages to write uh, uh, write in their um, Chamorro Carolinian language. And she produces these books. So that's one source of information, uh, language uh, that we're trying, language information that we have at the library. Um, on top of that, in, in our Pacific collection, we have the old um, 1970s, 60s, 70s and 80s, um, stories in Chamorro that um, were written and produced by um, the public school system uh, that we care for and, and we're in the process of digitizing that because we cur we really don't have much um, language books in Chamorro but I'm really I'm really thankful of the partnership and the contributions that the Lady Diane Torres Foundation have done uh, thus far for the community and for promoting uh, the importance of language, Chamorro and Carolinian language in Saipan. Sidus Masi. Sidus Masi. And so Archie, do, are you aware of uh, things written in Chamorro in the Northern Marianas uh, Museum archives? Actually, uh, I don't get to see them because I'm not certified. <laughs> Usually we go to Scott Russell uh, for advice if there is, cause he's there since the eighties and he was doing everything he can with the HPO, the Historic Preservation Office. But the only Chamor book we had was like a children's book. It was like the 12 days of Christmas in Chamor. But we ran out, uh, we sold it out and when I came into the museum, whatever is there was there. So I sold everything off. Uh, we only have like 20% merchandise left. So from our director, uh, we are getting new merchandise. So one of the merchandise I'm trying to get is like the Chamorro Dictionary. Which is why I asked Elisa if she has a copy or mm -hmm. if, you guys, if they sell it, we can get it. But yeah, we need it. We need oh, you, <laughs> you have to be careful there, Archie, because uh, the the CNMI is working on their own dictionary. And so if you get the yes. one from Guam, you might be starting something. You <laughs> might be starting some uh, some some island rivalries because uh, the orthography, the way they spell is is different in the islands. Yes. And so, Sidus Masi, Elisa, and for you, what kind of things does the Commission have? A lot more, um, I guess you can say, uh, contemporary texts written in Chamorro language. So um, through our partnerships, we have things like um, the, the GDOE Chamorro Studies uh, Division texts, right? So a lot of educational material that's currently being used in the public school system. We have a variety of, of dictionaries, even uh, those that were generated in the past, right? The Naval era, uh, the German uh, Chamorro Dictionary. Uh, we have um, stories written in Chamorro that have just been documented and saved over time. We have um, sort of like diary uh, entries, journal entries and things like that. And then again, in, a, in addition to our own uh, materials that Kumashan produced or Kumashan generated materials. 
Ooh, wonderful, wonderful. And so, you know, for those, for people who are fans of the Chamorro language and its history, um, I definitely encourage you sign up as a patron for Finatsu because um, if you sign up as a patron on Patreon for Finatsu, you get access to extra content. And so last month, for example, we did a, what's called a radical reading in which we looked at the oldest known complete document written in the Chamorro language from the year 1798. They call it the Garrido Manuscript. And so if you if you sign up for uh, Fanatsu as a patron, then you can get access to that. It was a uh, you can get you get a copy of the document. It, the the close the translation that we have now was done by Jeremy Cepeda, um, Leonard Iriarte, as well as Carlos Madrid, Dr. Carlos Madrid. And so through for those of you who are fans of Chamorro language stuff at Fanatsu, we've got you can get access to all sorts of things. Um, that, that I've been able to collect uh, from over the years. And so we have some questions and we have some comments. And so, oh, we have a question from Dana. Dana is a Fanatsu patron, Sidus Masi, Dana. And she says, I wish my grandma was here to listen and watch you all with me right now. She would be so happy by your dedication to Guahan and the Chamor language and culture. Once again, thank you for all you do. Javier Ojeda uh, Dietrich, the granddaughter, uh, is 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 Dana. Oh, Sidus Masi Dana. Um, and so, oh, and then Simone, who's also another Fanatsu patron, she asks, is this being recorded? And I just want to remind everybody that Fanatsu goes out live. If if everything is set up properly, then Fanatsu goes out live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and is archived on all three of those sites. So if you miss the live episode, then you can always uh, check it out later. And then Lillian, Senora Lillian Cruz, who's a fanat longtime Fanatsu patron, Senora Lillian, she says, Buenas to all of you in Hawaii. Sidus Masi uh, Lillian. And so I actually wanted to ask, because Erlinda, you had brought up sort of the issue of your grandmother. And I think that that is one thing that has made this museum conference, this museum institute, very, very different is that you know if you if you have a group of people curators who are talking about other people's other people's cultures and histories they can be respectful but these are not people that they are connected to the way that we are connected to the people in our own islands right so they can be very respectful they can be very careful they can do a, a good job but they they they're they're ultimately disconnected from it you know, they're no, they don't have the same feeling, emotion, uh, that emotions that we do tied to this. And so I wanted to talk about that because uh, his, historically in history, anthropology, archaeology, museum studies, people were told that you shouldn't do anything related to your own community because you couldn't be objective. Right, so if you're an anthropologist, you can't study your own people because you can't be objective. And so, um, Erlinda, to you first, thinking then about sort of the 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 lessons that you've learned from your from your grandmother, other elders in your life, sort of how do you respond to that though? That idea that you know we shouldn't be because we can't be objective, we shouldn't be doing our own museums or telling our own stories or studying our own people. What is your response to that? Um, my response to that is, it, that's the, this is the reason why we're losing our culture and our, our own tradition, losing ourselves, because if we can't study our own people, then, then who will? Who, who will be the best person or the best people to, to study their own, but to study, like for example, in our case, Chamorro, who will be the best person to study the Chamorro, but the Chamorros? Um, we know, we, we learn from generations to generations from what my grandma and my grandpa taught me, and I pass them down to my kids. And I, I, I hope that one day when I'm not here, no longer here, my, my children will pass it down to their children, you know. So to me, uh, that, that, that idea of not being able to, to, um, 
to study your own kind, your your own um, your own people is is sad. Uh, and I hope that we change that, kind of change that mentality in people and allow people to choose what they want, who who they want to study and what they want to study. I think it's one way for us to continue our tradition and our culture and, and our Chamorro, Chamorro history is by another Chamorro teaching it. I think that's the best way to learn is from someone you know that knows history of Chamorro. Uh, Archie, did you want to, to provide some thoughts on that? Yes, just a short one. Mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, we have visitors, right, coming to the museum. So they basically know the basic understanding of their history. But in depth, they don't really know about it. Uh, they don't know some other artifacts that's connected to their culture. So this is why I'm here. Uh, teaching them and explaining what are these artifacts that's related to their culture and how we can keep it alive and just bring back the traditions that our ancient ancestors uh, used. So that, yeah, that's the only thing I have about that. Now, Sidus Masi. And uh, Elissa, to, your, uh, to you as well. So before, before I go to you though, you know, one of the things that I've noticed about this is, of course, that it has been a very emotional time. As uh, even one of the people who was presenting today said, I'm a crier, I'm going to cry. You know, and that we've had a, a, and a number of the participants and those who are the instructors have also sort of uh, shown a lot of emotion, right? Um, when talking about things of, uh, that are very personal and important to them when talking about injustices, when feeling inspired, right? That there's, the room is just filled with emotion. And this is different than thinking about the, the picture that Sean Mallon showed us of all of the white guys in nice suits who talk about the Pacific, right? I think that those guys should have cried a lot more and probably should have hugged more, probably should have, uh, yeah, Drinking, they should have drank some tuba, perhaps enough tuba to to let the tears flow, but they didn't. Their emphasis on curation, on anthropology, on history was very detached, emotionless. That those things aren't helpful, aren't useful in it. But what we've seen is sort of the power of feeling strongly attached and inspired by this. And so, Elissa, I wanted to sort of. Uh, to hear your thoughts on that, because I do remember you talking, for example, about when we did the exercise about what what artifact would we put into the museum. Um, I remember you sharing, and because we were talking about um, sort of how how can we push back against that idea that we aren't supposed to study our own people, or we aren't supposed to to you know that that it makes us uh, that it prevents us from being objective, right? How can we push back against that? And so I wanted to hear your thoughts. Okay, I'm so sorry. Were you talking about the personal object or this is a previous oh, okay. conversation? It could be that. Yes, it could be that. I was, but uh, that was what I remembered in terms of, uh, in terms of you showing a lot of emotion. Cause I mean, I can tell you that uh, if you go to most academic conferences, you know, if you showed as much emotion as people have been showing, uh, in this week, people might judge you. They might think, oh my goodness, I thought all islanders did the hula, but they're they're so cranky. They're always crying. Right. You know? um, yeah, you know, I think, um, I, I know you're, you're mentioning my, my personal item, which is the Sanahi, right? That my godmother wore. Um, I guess just to provide context for uh, the viewers, uh, we had to, our assignment was to pick an object that we felt reflected us that we would submit uh, in a museum exhibit. And it could be a, you know, a contemporary object or uh, something of the past. I chose um, a Sanahi, which my godmother wore. As, as you know, as tomorrow's know that, that 
the idea of a woman wearing a sanahi, you know, it can be a sort of a controversial issue because the sanahi is associated with, uh, or it's the jewelry, right, worn traditionally by two Muslim men. Um, but my um, godmother uh, had come out as queer at the time. And so uh, that, you know, being a, a very courageous thing of her to do, uh, my mom and I gifted her a sanahi uh, to wear because she was also not just uh, an LGBTQ plus rights uh, advocate, but also uh, an activist. And she was someone who was, I think, very, um, she was very supportive and influential in my development, my growth as a, as a you know, young tomorrow activist at the time as, as I was coming into that. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's been, um, I chose that object because I think for us, like my, my personality really reflects my godmother, my Nina. I, I think about the battles and the challenges that she uh, went through, even challenging um, in, in, in supporting um, cultural uh, rights or some rights, you know, having to challenge sometimes our uh, family members who are, you know, pro military, right? We have a lot of, of family members who are in the military, as I'm sure many other tomorrow families do. But just basically being courageous enough, being bold enough to to show that resistance, um, even to those that we love, right? So that was the uh, sort of thing I wanted to share. Her, you know, she passed away, um, but her spirit lives on. And um, my grandmother, her mom. Uh, gifted me the, gave back basically um, the Sanahi that we had originally gifted her. So I, I carry that with me uh, for strength. But that was the um, incident or that was the uh, moment that Dr. Bavak was talking about um, in terms of like the kinds of spaces that they allow us uh, to have and to share in. But going back to like your, your conversation about what it means to like operate in these spaces and 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 share history about our people or do the work of of highlighting our people. This is something I think about a lot as a historian, someone who's taught, you know, through the history department who operates with both Tomoto historians and white historians here and um, something that you know I, I, I critique is well, one is this idea that tomorrow is like something of the past. And so when people think tomorrow history, maybe even sometimes tomorrow exhibits, it's like let's let's go straight to prehistory or or um, the material culture of our ancestors and, and those things are great, showing the Lati, um, their stone implements and things like that are, are, are wonderful to share. But, you know, as a people, we've also uh, created many other things right along the way that are worth uh, sharing. And um, so that's just sort of one um, point of critique. Another is within, I guess, the field of history, those that are not willing to, I think, sit or analyze like our colonial history and our political or our colonial realities today, they have an interesting way of kind of like dancing around the issue. Um, and one point is to like when they, for example, when we talk about colonialism, there's a tendency to just focus on some cultural change and continuity, as opposed to unpacking, let's say for example, settler colonialism or another critique I have um, in history or among Guam historians is the um, inability or the, like the, uh, what's the term? The, I'm finding the word. It's this articulation that for example, self-determination contemporary political issues is a trend and therefore something that we shouldn't like unpack or it's not a topic worth studying 
or, uh, or encouraging our students to study. And I think that's very problematic because what is the point of learning history if we're not connecting it uh, uh, you know, to the issues we face today, the challenges we face today. And so that is my personal critique and why I think sometimes students, especially Tomorrow students, um, you know, don't want to engage in this field, not just because there's so much reading and writing to do, but because we're not allowing the space for that, those discussions. You know, we're not allowing them to, to unpack the issues they're having with their identity or learning some heavy topics in Guam history for the first time. And, you know, when you think about that, it's like, what are we doing for the next generation, right? And that's just within the university and that institution itself. But what about, you know, um, these other spaces, museum spaces, libraries, are we allowing that space for, for our students or for our youth? I think that's something to think about. And it's, it's um, there are many examples here of how, you know, the Hawaiian community is also thinking about this and, and also making space for them. So, yeah, I think I went on like a tangent there, but so many <laughs> needed to. to Malika. Malika. No, no, no. Bali, I think if you've ever listened to any any story from a Chamorro elder, tangents are, are normal. Tangents can be beautiful and tangents can, can bring you back to a truth that you didn't realize. Um, but I do want to I do want to echo uh, what you said, though, because it's the other side of of colonial of colonization. Right. Is that sort of if you and you're you know, you're a historian, so you're familiar with the U.S. Navy basically saying, oh, you know, tomorrow's they live in Arcadian simplicity. They don't care about politics. They don't care about it. government. They just want to live on their farms. You know, they just want to go to church, live on their farms, and that's what they want. That's who they are. And so that's colonial imperial rhetoric. It's meant to basically say, well, so if we don't give them a ch uh, any power in government, that's kind of what they want anyways, right? Oh, yeah, it's, it's sort of that rhetoric that justifies your presence. But the problem, though, is that, that those ideas can end up seeping into and becoming part of how Chamorro see themselves. Where Chamorro see, oh yeah, you know, oh man, you know, this is really complicated. We should bring in somebody who's not from the Marianas to handle this. You know, oh man, yeah. Oh, we should do a, like a good story about this. We should bring in somebody who's probably light complected and, and has a non, you know, Chamorro name or fancy degrees after their name right and so we can perpetuate those 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 colonial dynamics in simple ways by just looking down on ourselves and thinking little of ourselves and even it's something that happens when we complain about government corruption and people say oh we can't decolonize because look at how we can't even run our government and so, you know, when you're talking about that, it's, it's so important that historians, museums, those in the cultural, you know, in the, in, in the cultural industries that we recognize these things and we tackle them. We don't run away from them and pretend, like you said, that they're just fads or trends or, oh, yeah, you know, decolonization is something people talk about now, but they won't be soon. So what's the big deal? You know, this is an issue that the Chamorro people have been fighting for a long time and different generations, it takes a different form, but it's all about being treated with respect, being treated with dignity, getting something better for the next generation. And so, okay, I wanna give you one last chance because we are just about out of time, but I wanted, we have a question from Senora Lillian Cruz and I see that also, hey, Senora Florence is also tuning in now. Um, two of the, mo the most reliable uh, watchers of Finanzo, the Cruz sisters, Cindy Senora Lillian and Senora Florence, Sidus Masi. And so um, if you could have one wish for your institution, that your institution would get something that you've been hoping for for a long time, what would that be? And so um, actually, uh, or Senora Linda, let's start with you first. So 
if if the the Joten uh, Kizu library could get something that you've wanted for a long time, what would, if you could wish for something, what would it be? Um, I know what I want if I do get it, if I can, it's actually expanding the library. So expanding the library um, to, to have more rooms for students to study or community to study. But my vision of expansion uh, project for the library is to have a, a two-story building uh, solid concrete so that we can expand our Pacific collection, expand all the uh, artifacts that we have and collect more of our, our local culture books. Uh, that's that's my dream. If, if I could have that, that that would be awesome. Jesus Masi. Biba, hugo tzahua na hungan. Hungan. Archie, I know, uh, and just remember, you're you're not representing any official uh, recommendation to the board or anything like that. But just to, so, don't worry, you're not. It's not a legal contract. Whatever you say right now. But what do you <laughs> think? If you could make one wish, what would the NMI Museum? Uh, what would you want? Um, one wish that I want is uh, more storage spaces. Because all our three offices in the museum are filled with artifacts. <laughs> so shelves in the office, three of it is, um, we don't util utilize it offices, but we utilize it as storage spaces. And plus I wish to have a creating room, which we don't have. <laughs> so that's about it. See, see, Pogomas, Pogomas. I, I definitely hear you. Spaces is one of those things all museums struggle with. And so, Elissa, what would you want for the, the Kumishon? I have the same wish, but I think um, to change things up, I'll, I'll just say manpower. We have a lot of projects uh, that we need to execute and uh, we need uh, professionals and specialists to help execute them. So manpower. And remember, it's election year in the Marianas. So the next time you see your Godzu or your or your least favorite Godzu, <laughs> your Imazamuna Godzu, Imas, but Igoftizamuna Godzu, remind them about the importance of arts, literacy, culture, museums, because you know. People will always say, oh, you know what? We need more police officers. We need more uh, this, or this or that. And communities can always use more resources for those sorts of things. But if you want a, a, a community that is rooted, where people feel valued, respected, comfortable, where they know who they are, where they feel confident about looking into the future and then tackling the problems that they are gonna face, you need education, you need to support artists, you need to support culture, you need to support museums, because those are the things that make people, especially youth, feel grounded into something so that they don't feel lost, they don't feel confused, they don't turn to all of the social ills to find answers or to, to just repress things, but they feel I'm connected to something. It's a story that goes back thousands of years. I'm part of something. And so Remember when you see your when you see your gods who say, "Hey, don't forget what about the end of my museum?" And you don't have to quote Archie because um, you don't have to quote Archie uh, or or Senor Linda. You know, hey, hey, what about the the library? The library needs more space. But bring that up though, you know, because that's part of elevating our status and educating ourselves as a community. Is that these are things that we are taking ownership of. And so we need to support them, not wait for somebody else to support them. We need to take care of them. All right. Sidzus Masi, Hamzun Atres, Prestina Conversation. Thank you so much for this conversation. I enjoyed it greatly. And so put favor in the comments to all of you watching. If you want to hear from the members of the Museum Institute, there's two other members that are not here with us. There's Tyler Warwick and there's Nicole Delisle Duenas. And if you are interested, then when we are finished next month, we can all come back together and you can hear more about our, our journey in this program. But enoha para pogo esti finakpun esti na episode. Si dus ma si tatlo ni hamzu todos ni umeegad zan umeekungok. Adios esta kimanali hitatlo.